Preface to Ben Pepper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Ben Pepper by Margaret Sidney. Preface. It was quite impossible that the detailed records presented through the later Pepper books of the doings and sayings of the Little Brown House family should admit Ben he the eldest born of mother pepper's brood and her mainstay after the father died the quiet steady as a rock boy as the badger town people all called him with lots of fun in him too because he could not help it being a pepper was worthy of a book to himself so the hosts of readers of the pepper series decided and many of them accordingly besought the author to give ben a chance to be better known he was always so ready to efface himself that it was Margaret Sidney's responsibility, after all, to bring him more to the front, to be understood by all who loved his life in the earlier records. So Margaret Sidney, despite Ben's wishes, has written this latest volume. To do it, Polly and Joel and David and Phronsie have told her most lovingly the facts with which it is strewn. Most of all, Mother Pepper Fisher contributed to the new book, out of a heart full of gratitude and love for her Ben. Margaret Sidney. End of preface. Chapter One of Ben Pepper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Ben Pepper by Margaret Sidney. Chapter One. The Christmas Shopping Expedition. "'Oh, yes, the children can go as long as Ben and Polly are with them,' said Mother Fisher, with pride. "'I'll trust them anywhere,' her face said as plainly as if she had put it all into words. "'I wish I could go with them,' Mrs. Whitney took her gaze from the busy fingers sorting the pile of small stockings Jane had brought up from the laundry, and went abruptly over to the window with a troubled face. "'But you can't,' said Mrs. Fisher, cheerfully, nowise dismayed at the number of holes staring up at her. "'So don't let us think any more of it.' "'And Ben's big enough to take them anywhere, I'm sure.' "'And Polly can look after their manners,' she thought, but didn't finish aloud. "'You see, Father didn't know about this picture exhibit till Mr. Cabot's note came at half an hour ago, begging him not to miss it. "'And if I told him of the children's plans, he'd give the whole thing up and stay at home rather than have them disappointed. "'He mustn't do that.' "'Indeed he mustn't,' echoed Mrs. Fisher in her most decided fashion, and putting the last stocking into place on top of the big pile on the table. "'Hush! Here comes Polly!' "'Oh, Mamsie!' Polly rushed up to the work table. "'Just think what splendid fun!' She threw her arms around Mrs. Fisher's neck and gave her a big hug. "'Isn't Auntie Whitney too lovely for anything to take us out to buy our Christmas presents? Dear me, what richness!' "'Polly, see here, child!' Mother Fisher brought her face around to look into the rosy one. "'Mrs. Whitney cannot—' Polly tore herself away with a gasp, and stood quite still, her brown eyes fixed on Mother Fisher's face, and the color dying out of her cheek. "'Do you mean we're not to go, Mamsie?' she cried, her hands working nervously. "'We must!' she brought up passionately. "'You see, Polly,' Mrs. Whitney came quickly away from the window. Polly at that turned and stared in dismay. "'Oh, dear!' to think Auntie Whitney was there, and now she would be so distressed. "'It is just this way,' Mrs. Whitney was hurrying on, in quite as unhappy a state as Polly had feared. "'Father has received word that there is to be a picture exhibit this afternoon, and I must go with him. I'm sorry, dear, but it can't be helped.' She bent to kiss Polly's cheek, where the color had rushed this time up to the brown hair. "'I'm so sorry, too,' Polly burst out, clinging to Mrs. Whitney's hand. Oh, why had she given way to her passion? The tears were running down her cheeks now. I didn't mean, she murmured. Why, you're going, Polly, said Mrs. Whitney comfortingly, and patting the brown hair. What? exclaimed Polly, bringing up her head suddenly to stare into the kind face. Yes, laughed Mrs. Whitney. The Christmas shopping isn't to be given up. Mrs. Fisher is going to let you and Ben take the children. Just think, Polly, that's much better than to go with me she finished gaily. All this time Mother Fisher had sat quite still, her black eyes fastened on Polly's face. "'I don't know,' she said slowly, "'about their going now.' "'Oh, Mrs. Fisher!' cried Mrs. Whitney in dismay. "'You can't think of—' 
but she didn't finish on seeing Mrs. Fisher's face. Instead, she went softly out and closed the door. "'I didn't mean,' mumbled Polly again, and then she tumbled down on her knees and hid her face in Mamsie's lap, and sobbed as hard as she could. "'Yes, that's the trouble, Polly,' Mother Fisher's hands were busy smoothing the brown hair, "'and that's the mischief of it, not to mean to say a thing, and yet say it. "'Oh, dear me!' wailed Polly, burrowing deeper within the folds of the black alpaca apron. "'Why did I? Oh, dear!' Mother Fisher's hands kept on at their task, but she said nothing, and at last Polly's sobs grew quieter. "'Mamsie,' she said faintly. "'Yes, dear. I'm so sorry.' "'I know you are, child, but, Polly, there's no must unless Mother says so. And to fly into a passion, why, then you ought not to go at all.' "'Oh, I don't want to go now, Mamsie,' cried Polly, flying up to sit straight on the floor, and brushing away the tears with a hasty hand. "'I really don't, Mamsie.' "'Well, then, you see you'll just keep the children at home,' said Mrs. Fisher, "'for I can't let Ben have all the care alone, and they'll be so disappointed.' Polly gave a groan and wriggled on the carpet in distress. "'You see, Polly, that's the trouble when we give way to our passion. It hurts more than ourselves,' said Mother Fisher. "'So I can't see but that you've got to go.' "'Oh, I don't want to, Mamsie. Don't make me!' cried Polly, squeezing her mother's hands tightly in both of her own. "'I can't go now.' "'Tut, tut, Polly,' said Mrs. Fisher, reprovingly. "'Can't isn't the thing to say any more than must.' and her black eyes had such a look in them that Polly ducked her head, taking refuge in the lap again. "'And now you must get up,' said Mother Fisher, "'and get ready, for I'm going to let you and Ben take the children. That's decided.' "'Oh, Mamsie!' Polly found her feet somehow and flung her arms again around her mother's neck. "'You won't trust me ever again. Oh, dear me!' "'Yes, I will,' said Mrs. Fisher quickly, and seizing Polly's hands, she made the brown eyes look at her. "'Why, Polly, child, did you suppose Mother would let you go and help Ben take care of the children, if she didn't know you would do everything just right? Never say such a word as that again, Polly.' And the black eyes shone with love and pride. "'And now hurry, child, for here's Ben coming,' as steps sounded in the hall, and then his voice asking, "'Where's Mamsie?' Polly flew up to her feet and stumbled over to the washstand. "'Oh, dear me!' she gasped, catching sight of her face in the long mirror on the way. "'I can't! Oh, I mean, my eyes are so red, and my nose, Mamsie, just look at it!' "'That's the trouble of crying and giving way to fits of passion,' observed Mrs. Fisher quietly. "'It makes a good deal of trouble, first and last,' as Ben came hurrying in. Polly splashed the water all over her hot face with such a hasty hand that a little stream ran down the pretty brown waist, which only served to increase her dismay. "'Oh, Mamsie,' Ben was saying, "'we're not to go after all. "'What a pity! "'Polly'll be so sorry!' His blue eyes looked very much troubled. To have anything make Polly sorry hurt him dreadfully. "'Oh, yes, you're going, Ben,' Mrs. Fisher made haste to say. "'Why, Auntie Whitney can't go,' said Ben in surprise. "'Grandpapa just said she's going out with him.' "'You didn't say anything of the shopping plan, Ben,' ejaculated Mrs. Fisher involuntarily. Yet she knew she didn't need to ask the question. "'Why, no,' said Ben, in amazement. "'Of course not, Mamsie.' "'Of course not, too,' said his mother with a little laugh. "'And why ask such a stupid question, I'm sure I don't know, Ben.' All this gave Polly time to sop her face quite cool, and she had buried her red cheeks in the towel to dry them off, when Mother Fisher, having made Ben acquainted with the joyful news, called, "'Come, Polly. It's time to get on your hat and coat.' "'Hello, Polly, you there?' cried Ben, whirling round, as Polly hurried into the little room next door to get her out-of-door things. "'Yes,' called back Polly on her way. "'I'll be ready in a minute, Ben.' "'Isn't it no end jolly that we're going, Polly?' he cried, deserting his mother to hurry over to the doorway, where he could stand and see Polly get ready. His blue eyes shone, and his head was held very high. To think that Polly and he were to be allowed to take the children out shopping amid all the excitement of Christmas week— it was almost too good to be true. "'Say, Polly, did you ever know anything like it?' He came in and pressed close to the bureau, where Polly was putting on her hat. "'Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> Polly, with all her eyes on the red-rimmed ones, looking out at her from the mirror, beside which she saw of the poor swollen nose, jammed on the hat over her face and jumped away from the bureau. "'You needn't hurry so,' said Ben. "'Tisn't any matter if we don't start right away.' Besides, I don't suppose Jane has Phronsie ready yet. 
but isn't it perfectly splendid that we can go alone you and i and just think polly pepper can take the children he was quite overcome again at the idea and leaned against the bureau to think it all out yes said polly in a muffled voice but she was in the closet now getting into her coat because if she stayed out in the room ben would help her into it and then he would be sure to see her face so ben although he thought it funny that polly who was generally bubbling over with joy at the prospect of any pleasant expedition should be very quiet and dull in the light of such an extraordinary one set it down to the hurry she was in getting ready oh polly don't hurry so he cried going over to the closet here come out here and let me help you with that Ugh, no go right away ben said polly wriggling off frantically and only succeeding in flopping up one sleeve to knock her hat further down over her nose oh dear me where is the other armhole do come out cried ben who ever heard of trying to put on a coat in a closet whatever makes you polly and i do wish you'd go away cried polly quite exasperated and setting her hat straight forgetting all about her face but instead ben after a good look took hold of her two shoulders and marched her out into the room and before polly knew it her other arm was in its sleeve and he was trying to button up her coat oh benzy she mumbled i'm so sorry i was cross never mind said ben giving her a comforting pat well come on now you're ready polly and joel and david plunging in tumultuously into mumsey's room followed by jane ushering in phronsie all attired for the trip the whole bunch gathered around Mother Frisser's chair for final instructions. "'See, Mumsy,' piped Phronsie, crowding up closely, to hold up the little money-bag dangling by its chain from her arm. "'My own purse, and I'm going to buy things.' "'Don't, Fron,' said Joel. "'Push so,' and he tried to get past her to stand nearest to Mother Fisher. "'What are you doing yourself?' said Ben. "'I should like to know, Joel Pepper.' "'Well, that was my place,' said Joel loudly, and not yielding an inch." joel said mrs fisher it was my place he grumbled but he hung his head and wouldn't look up into mamsie's face it's my very own purse cried phronsie in a joyful little key and i'm going to buy things i am see mamsie she held it up before mrs fisher and patted it lovingly while she cried it in worse than ever yes i see said mrs fisher smiling down into her face but there was no smile for joel and looking up he caught her black eyes resting on him in a way he didn't like "'You may have it, Fron!' he exclaimed, tumbling back against David suddenly, who was nearly knocked over by his sudden rebound. "'I'd just as lief you would. Here, get it next to Mamsie.' "'And I'm going to buy you something, Mamsie,' said Phronsie, standing on her tiptoes, to whisper confidentially into Mother Fisher's ear. "'You are, dear?' Mrs. Fisher leaned over to catch the whisper, but not before she sent a smile over to Joel, that it seemed to drop right down into the farthest corner of his heart." now mother i like that very much indeed and you must be surprised said phronsie bobbing her head in its big fur-trimmed bonnet and fastening a grave look of importance on mother fisher's face oh ho, ho began joel who had recovered his composure then he thought and stopped and again mother fisher smiled at him now children you understand this is the first time you have ever been out shopping without mr king or mrs whitney or me began mrs fisher looking around on them all well it's quite time that you should make the trial for i can trust you all she lifted her head proudly and her black eyes shone i'm sure you'll all be good oh we will we will mumsy declared all the little peppers together and their heads went up too in pride so i'm going to let ben and polly take you about in the shops and whatever they tell you you are to do and remember one thing you are not to crowd and push we can't see if the big people all get in front said joel grumblingly then you must go without seeing said mrs fisher decidedly at any rate you're not to crowd and push remember joel and all of you i won't said joel crowd and push now may we go mumsy and he began to prance to the door impatiently one thing more come back joel mrs fisher waited until the group was once more quiet around her chair and you are none of you to handle things not when we're going to buy them cried joel in an injured tone oh mamsie i should think we might when we're out shopping and i've got such lots of money in my pocketbook he swung it high clenched in his hot little fist take care or you'll lose it if you show it like that joe said ben how am i going to lose it demanded joel squaring around at ben somebody'll pick it out of your hand if you don't look out warned ben i guess there won't anybody pick my pocketbook i'm going to get a pin and he raced off to the big mahogany bureau in the corner 
"'What for?' asked David, who always followed Joel's movements with attention. "'What are you going to do with a pin, Joel?' "'I'm going to pin up my pocket so no old picker can get my purse,' declared Joel with energy, and running back with the biggest pin he could find on the cushion, the one Mrs. Fisher fastened her shawl with. "'Yes, and likely enough you'll forget all about it and stick your own hand in,' said Ben. "'Then, says I, what'll you do, Joel?' "'Humph! <laughs> I won't forget,' snorted Joel, puckering up the pocket edge and jamming the pin through the folds. "'There, I guess the pickers will let my pocket alone.' "'Yes, sirree!' he cried triumphantly. "'Now you remember you're not to touch things on the counters,' Mrs. Fisher was saying. "'I don't want my children to be picking and handling at such a time. "'You can look all you want to, but when you see what you would really like to buy, "'why, Polly and Ben must ask the saleswoman to show it to you.' "'I've got my money purse,' said Phronsie, exactly as if the fact had not been announced before. "'See, Mumsy!' and she held it up with an important air. "'I see,' said Mother Fisher. "'It's the one Grandpapa gave you last birthday, isn't it, Phronsie?' yes she said patting it lovingly my dear grandpapa gave it to me and it's my very own and i'm going to buy things i am so you shall said mrs fisher approvingly all the while joel was screaming come on fron we'll be late as he pranced out into the hall and down the stairs oh mamsie polly flung her arms around mrs fisher's neck i wish you were going too well mother can't go said mrs fisher patting polly's shoulder and take care phronsie will hear you "'And I want to kiss my mamsie good-bye, too,' said Phronsie, clambering up into Mrs. Fisher's lap, as well as she could for the fur-trimmed coat. So Mother Fisher took her up, and Phronsie cooed and hummed her satisfaction, and was kissed and sat down again. And then David had to say good-bye, too, and Ben as well, and then Polly made up her mind she would have the last kiss, so it was some minutes before the four children got out of Mamsie's room and ran down the stairs. And there they found Joel hanging on to the new old post and howling, "'You've been an awful long time! Come on!' "'We wanted to bid Mamsie good-bye,' said Polly, twitching Phronsie's coat straight. "'Well, we're all ready now. Come on, children.' Joel had thrown the big front door open with a flourish and was running out. When Polly said that about Mamsie, he stopped suddenly, then plunged back, nearly upsetting Phronsie, and ran over the steps as fast as he could. "'Oh, Mamsie!' he cried, flying up to her. Mrs. Fisher had gotten out of her chair and was now over by the window to see her little brood go off so happy and important. "'Why, Joel, what's the matter?' as he precipitated himself into her arms. "'I want to kiss you good-bye, too,' howled Joel, burrowing within them. "'Good-bye, Mamsie!' "'So you shall, Mother's boy,' said Mrs. Fisher, cuddling him. "'Well, now, Joel, you remember all I said.' "'I'll remember,' said Joel, lifting a radiant face. "'I'll be good all the time.' "'Yes, you must, else mother'll feel badly. Well, good-bye.' Joel's good-bye floated back as he raced down the stairs and overtook the group waiting for him out on the big stone steps. "'Who's keeping us waiting now, I wonder?' said Ben, as he came up panting. "'Well, I guess I'm going to bid my mumsy good-bye, too,' said Joel importantly. "'Come on, Dave, let's race to the big gate.' End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Ben Pepper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Chambers. Ben Pepper by Margaret Sidney. Chapter Two Ben's Plan. When Phronsie saw the two boys racing away, she wanted to run too and started to patter off after them. No, no, Phronsie, said Polly, calling her back. She'll get all tired out to begin with, she said to Ben then what should we do oh i want to race to the big gate with joel and david said phronsie coming back slowly can i polly do let me she begged no said polly decidedly you'll get all tired out phronsie i won't be tired said phronsie drawing herself up very straight i won't be polly you will be if you run and race to begin with declared polly very much wishing she could join the boys herself but she was holding phronsie's hand by this time and it never would do to leave her so we must walk till we reach the car Phronsie heaved a sigh, but she kept tight hold of Polly's hand and walked obediently on. You see, said Polly, who never could bear to hear Phronsie's sigh, we're going shopping, Phronsie, and there's a good deal of walking we have before us, and, and I have my money bag, cried Phronsie, breaking in jubilantly, and not waiting for Polly to finish, and lifting it high as it dangled from her arm. See, Polly, and dear Grandpapa gave it to me. He did. I know, pet, said Polly. Take care now, or you'll tumble on your nose. 
and i'm going to buy my dear grandpapa something declared phronsie with a bob of her fur trim bonnet i am polly so you shall cried polly radiantly now that'll be fine polly said ben to her other side i've been thinking of something that perhaps it would be good to do oh ben what is it she cried all in a twitter to know for ben's plans if sometimes slow were always good to follow why let's us all put our money together instead of buying little things for grandpapa for of course we are all going to give him something and buy one good present it was a long speech for ben and he was quite glad when it was all out let's said polly quite enchanted oh ben you do think of just the right things no said ben i don't think of such nice things as you do polly and he looked at her admiringly i can't well your things are always the best in the end anyway said polly unwilling to take so much praise and preferring that ben should have it oh dear me joel with david at his heels came tumbling up you are so slow just like snails he grumbled just like snails echoed phronsie with very pink cheeks stepping very high all her attention on the money bag dangling from her wrist well we can't go any faster joe said ben so you must make up your mind to be satisfied well i'm not satisfied declared joel in a dudge in so it seems said ben with a little laugh and it isn't the way when people are going shopping to run through the streets said polly so when you get outside the gateway you've got to walk joel it isn't elegant to race along when polly said elegant with such an air the children always felt very much impressed and little david now hung his head quite ashamed i'm sorry i ran polly he said oh it's no matter in here said polly but when we get outside then you must walk in a nice way mamsie would want you to oh now ben go on with your plan and tell the rest oh now you've been talking up things you and ben you're always doing that polly pepper cried joel loudly and he tried to crowd in between polly and phronsie see here you get back cried ben seizing his jacket collar you're not to crowd so joe well you and polly are always talking secrets said joel but he fell back with ben nevertheless and keeping them from dave and me then you should have stayed with us said ben calmly we didn't know you were going to talk secrets grumbled joel oh we've only just begun said polly brightly looking over past phronsie so you'll hear it all joey and davy too she added looking off to little david on the farther end of the line i'm not going to stir a step away ever again declared joel squirming up as close to ben as he possibly could then you can't talk things without i hear them you've got to give me a little more of the walk joe said ben striding on and thrusting out his elbow on joel's side else you'll go behind oh dear i want to hear what you're going to say whined joel but he gave way moving up against david who was the last in the row well do begin he begged yes do tell them ben said polly well you see said ben as they turned out of the big stone gateway we're all to give grandpapa a present each one i mean i am shouted joel jumping up and down whoopity la wickets i am oh joel pepper exclaimed polly looking down the row at him whenever polly said joel pepper everybody felt that the case was very serious so joel hung his head and looked quite sheepish mamsie would be so sorry to hear you say that went on polly well he isn't going to say it again said ben i don't believe no i'm not declared joel his black head going up again never again polly that's right she smiled approvingly oh now do go on again ben she said with your plan yes we're all going to give grandpapa presents cried joel before ben had time to put in a word i am and i won't tell what i'm going to buy either you can't make me dave he slapped the pocket containing his purse but encountering the big pen drew off his finger ow there who's hurt now cried ben with a laugh as he looked down at the rueful face pooh it didn't hurt any said joel pulling off his glove to suck the drop of blood that came up to meet him david who never could bear to see joel hurt pressed up to see the extent of his injury and turned pale perhaps it went clear through his finger for it was mamsie's big shawl pin oh don't joel cried polly with a grimace take your handkerchief do no i'm not going to said joel squirming away and repeating the process as another little drop appeared i can spit it out and my handkerchief will stay bad joel said polly sternly you must not do that do you hear me well that's the last drop anyway declared joel so i haven't got to do anything let me see said polly feeling quite motherly with all her brood to look after so the whole row stopped and joel leaned over and thrust out his finger for polly to examine it yes that's all right she said with a big sigh of relief well now we must hurry for we have so much to do and ben do go on well you see grandpapa has so many things that it'll be hard to pick out five that he'd like said ben so i thought he'll like mine interrupted joel hold on joe and wait till i get through commanded ben turning on him and if you interrupt again you must walk behind joel said polly severely i don't want to walk behind said joel ducking as he caught her glance well then you mustn't interrupt ben again declared polly in her most decided fashion 
oh i won't i won't he promised much alarmed as he saw her face see that you don't then said ben well so it seems as if perhaps it would be a good plan to all put our money together and get grandpapa one good thing i think it would be a perfectly elegant plan declared polly radiantly joel stood stock still twitching at the end of ben's coat so that he was pulled up short i'm not going to put any money in he cried in a loud tone hey oh then you don't like the plan joe said ben getting his coat free and whirling around on him i'm not going to put any money in repeated joel in the same high key well then you needn't said ben no wise disturbed oh ben then we can't any of us do it said polly quite dismayed and it would have been so perfectly splendid she stopped short and phronsie looking up in surprise pulled her hand gently oh polly she exclaimed are you sick oh the rest of us will do it said ben coolly and joel can stay outside oh i'm not going to stay outside howled joel throwing his arms around ben and clinging to him in his distress i'm not i'm not ben don't make me i don't make you said ben getting himself free of joel's frantic little hands if you don't want to join us why you'll just have to stay by yourself i'm not going to stay by myself cried joel in the greatest distress need i polly and he flew over to her i don't want to stay by myself i don't but ben answered instead of polly hush now joel we're to walk along quietly else you'll have to go home and we'll vote now and all who don't want to get grandpapa one big nice present can just stay out of the plan polly and i are going together in it anyway which was just the same as saying the plan would be carried out if polly and ben were to join in it all the remainder of the five little peppers would consider it the greatest calamity to be left out so joel pushed as near to ben as he could get as the whole group drew off to the curbstone to vote on the question i'm in it i'm in it screamed joel making more than one passer-by turn the head to look back at the busy little group come on dave twitching that individual's jacket to get him into the center of things he's in it too ben he added anxious to have that settled beyond doubt david is everybody is looking at us said polly whose greatest pride was to have the children appear well and she looked quite mortified oh dear me and this was only the beginning of the christmas shopping now you must just understand joe ben laid hold of him we aren't going to have such carryings on look at polly how you're making her feel all the children now regarded polly anxiously phronsie standing on her tiptoe to achieve the best result oh i won't make her feel cried joel much alarmed i won't please don't polly i'll be good he promised his face worked and he had hard work not to burst out crying all right joey said polly trying to smile and the little pucker between her eyebrows straightened itself out at once and she leaned over and set a kiss on the chubby cheek you kissed me on the street said joel quite astounded why polly pepper and you said the other never mind broke in ben hastily and i couldn't help it said polly happily yet with a backwards glance to see if any one saw it for polly deeply loved to be fine on all occasions and if we're going shopping for christmas presents said ben we must hurry up hush joe don't say a word now how many want to put in their money to buy one big nice present for grandpapa instead of little bits of ones put up your hands joel shot a hand up as high as he could raise it while he stood on tiptoe and of course polly's went up and so did david's but phronsie stood looking down at her money bag dangling from her arm while she patted it lovingly and crooned softly to herself she doesn't understand said polly so she got down until she could look into the face with the fur trim bonnet look up pet now don't you want to buy grandpapa a big big present with all of us i'm going to buy my dear grandpapa a present cried phronsie in a happy little voice and taking her gaze from the money bag i am polly she declared dreadfully excited then she put her mouth close to polly's rosy cheeks i'm going to buy him a cat she whispered oh dear me exclaimed polly nearly tumbling over backward yes i am said phronsie decidedly a dear sweet little cat and grandpapa will like it he will well now said polly recovering herself don't you want to put the rest of your money you were going to spend for grandpapa's present into something big we're all going to do that phronsie and give him a nice present my present will be nice said phronsie gravely yes yes i know said polly quickly and giving the boys a look that told him to keep away from this conference but don't you want to help to buy this big present too i would phronsie pet if i were you i shall give him the cat said phronsie decidedly and bobbing her head yes of course but you can help to buy the other one too said polly i'll help buy the other hummed phronsie then she hopped away from polly and made a little cheese right on the sidewalk the fur-trimmed coat flew out as well as it could and the money bag also oh phronsie exclaimed polly in dismay getting her up as quickly as possible i'm going to buy a cat and a big thing too for my dear grandpapa announced phronsie to all the bunch as polly got her straight and smoothed down her coat and settled her bonnet all this proceeding took so much time that ben now hurried them off 
and they walked briskly along till presently they turned into the main street where most of the holiday shoppers were out in full force and as joel wanted to stop at each window that presented a smart display and that was furnished at nearly every step of the way they didn't make so very much progress after all we shan't get anywhere at this rate said ben at last in despair and hauling joel away from a fascinating window against which he had set his chubby face quite lost to the delightful show within he struck off at a smart pace threading his way quickly in and out of the crowd of shoppers so that polly and phronsie clinging to her hand had great difficulty to keep track of him at all david was pattering along in front as close to ben as he could get at last they stopped before a big toy shop and ben drew breath oh dear me cried polly hurrying up phronsie's bonnet was pushed awry where an excited shopper had knocked a big bundle against it so she couldn't see anything till polly had set it straight all of this took a little time meanwhile the bunch of shoppers was stopping the crowd get out of the way roared an expressman at them he was so crowded up with bundles that only his head was to be seen above the pile there was another heap on the pavement and a man loading up as fast as he could the already well-filled wagon and he gave joel a punch with something not his hand for that was full stop that joel squared up at him and doubled up his little fists joe joe cried ben suddenly that man pushed me with an old bundle said joel his eyes flashing well come on said ben picking his sleeve polly busy with phronsie had heard nothing of it oh dear dear david was wailing and i'll give you something more than a push if you don't get out of the way declared the expressman trying to look over his shoulder as he edged his way to the wagon you saucy cub you and he's calling me names cried joel wildly let me go back and make him stop and he shook his small fist in the air he's a bad old man and he hasn't any right let me go ben but ben by this time had joel well within the shop and the others following they were soon lost in the important business of choosing christmas presents let phronsie buy hers first said polly and the others even joel saying yes let phronsie buy hers first they edged their way along phronsie proclaiming in a high key as they threaded their course down a long aisle that she was going to buy grandpapa a cat so that everybody turned and smiled until at last they found a saleswoman who seemed to be willing and able to wait on them so you want a cat she said to phronsie who could just manage to see over the counter by standing on her tiptoes yes said phronsie i do a really and truly cat for my dear grandpapa oh we haven't any real cat said the woman turning back from the shelf she was looking over with a pair of sharp eyes we don't keep live cats in a shop nobody does she added she means that it must have fur on explained polly while the younger boys never took their eyes from the transaction this was quite one of the most important events of the afternoon for phronsie to choose her own present just at this juncture a stout old lady with a stiff black silk coat that made her bigger than ever as it had a trick of flying open and the sides blowing off seemed ready to engulf all unfortunate passers-by swept past phronsie and she disappeared from view for a moment stop that roared joel looking up into the soft white puffs above the woman's nose you most knocked my sister over the stately old woman looked down into the chubby face you impertinent boy she exclaimed then she set her profile disdainfully in the opposite direction and sailed on oh ben cried polly in consternation all the color gone out of her face what shall we do here pet and ben swung phronsie up to his shoulder now that's the best place for you in such a crowd i want a truly cat phronsie kept saying from her perch and swinging her feet delightedly she grasped ben's neck so tightly that it seemed as if he could hardly breathe and his face got very red i tell you we haven't got any live cats declared the saleswoman impatiently and slamming the glass door beneath here's a china one and she set it on the counter oh no phronsie shook her head polly meanwhile had been looking after the stately old woman and clasping and unclasping her hands nervously it wouldn't take but a minute to go after her for the big figure had paused in front of the doll counter and say how sorry she was for her brother and would she please excuse it and without stopping to think polly dashed off through the crowd no one of the little bunch of peppers seeing her go as they were lost in the transaction that was to get phronsie her cat she plunged up suddenly to the side of the stiff black silk coat now wedged in against the overcrowded counter its owner by no means in the best temper at her failure to attract any saleswoman to wait on her oh ma'am polly looked up into the impatient face and everything she had intended to say flew right out of her mind for the white puffs seemed to stand right out like mountains and the roman nose was so very dreadful my brother was all she could manage to say hey the stately old woman laid down a doll and glared at her my brother began polly wishing that she was back with the others if only she could catch a glimpse of ben but the intervening crowd surged in waves between her and the spot where she had left them so that they were swallowed up meantime there was that dreadful old woman 
with her cold sharp eyes just like gimlet's boring her through and through and waiting for her to finish what she had to say my brother began polly faintly and her head dropped said something naughty to you well said the old lady and she turned her back on the doll counter as far as she was able for being wedged in so and this time polly felt that she must make herself understood besides the people on either side were beginning to be interested and were nudging each other not to miss this funny thing so she began quite decidedly determined to be brave and say it all through my brother but the stately old lady broke in i don't know anything about your brother nor you girl and if you speak to me again i shall call the proprietor and she shook with indignation till all the jingle jet things and there seemed to be a great many under her silk coat made a great commotion i came to ask you to forgive my brother who spoke to you because you had brushed against my little sister polly was speaking so fast now a little red spot on either cheek that the stately old woman had to hear it was naughty of him and mamsie would be sorry naughty the old lady gasped for breath it was such a new idea to ask her to forgive a saucy boy still she couldn't make any other reply than it was scandalous and you are nearly as bad interrupting me in the midst of my christmas shopping then she turned to the dolls again leaving polly to stumble back as best she might to the place where she had left ben and the children but they were not there end of chapter two recording by stacy chambers Chapter Three of Ben Pepper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Ben Pepper by Margaret Sidney. Chapter Three. Haps and mishaps. I want Polly. Francie was saying, wholly lost now to the fact that the really truly cat for grandpapa had not been found bensie i do yes francie ben made out to say holding her hand fast we'll see her pretty soon she's lost cried joel wildly who up to this time had been so diverted by the bewildering array of tin soldiers drums and express wagons displayed on all sides as they threaded their way in among the crowds that surrounded the counters and shelves that he hadn't given his mind to anything else she's lost polly is he ended with a howl at this direful announcement phronsie gave one cry then she sat right down on the floor and lifted up her voice i want polly it was impossible to quiet her and everybody in the immediate vicinity turned and stared a small girl trying to decide between a woolly dog and a pig both of whose charms had held her for the past ten minutes laid them down on the counter and ran over to the place where the cry came from when she saw the little group she pushed in between them oh dear me she cried to phronsie sitting there in a small heap and sobbing pitifully how'd she get hurt little david made way for her instantly but joel who had stopped his wails in surprise at her appearance stood his ground go away he said his black eyes shining through his tears the small girl paid no attention to him how'd she get hurt she kept on asking she isn't hurt said ben not looking up as he knelt on the floor and wiped phronsie's streaming tears with his handkerchief there there phronsie stop crying oh dear me exclaimed the girl what a little goose to cry and she laughed derisively she isn't a goose cried joel in a loud injured tone my sister isn't a goose so now you just take that back you girl you joel commanded ben sternly stop this moment just as a floor walker stalked up you're blocking the way he said with a great deal of official manner and you must just take yourselves off out of this aisle little david who up to this time clasping and unclasping his hands nervously had said nothing now looked up into the cross face we've lost polly he exclaimed the floor walker not understanding repeated to ben you've just got to get out of this aisle but the small girl had heard oh dear me she exclaimed again now that's perfectly dreadful and she sat right down by phronsie's side I'll go and find her for you she said putting her hands on Phronsie's two small ones doubled up in the folds of the fur trimmed coat 
and i'm sorry i called you a goose don't cry i'll bring her back Phronsie, astonished out of her grief and hearing the welcome words i'll bring her back looked up radiantly the tears trailing off down the round cheeks while joel whose face had become a lively red blurted out and i'm sorry i was bad to you staring at the girl oh i didn't mind you said the girl carelessly now who is polly she looked at ben as she spoke meanwhile she was helping phronsie to her feet here she is now i guess she gave a sharp bird-like glance between the crowd then started off like a flash winding herself in and out of the throng and up to a girl a little bigger than herself are you polly she demanded breathlessly polly rushing along searching one side and the other frantically for a glimpse of ben's blue cap and sturdy shoulders she hadn't much hope of seeing the children for the crowd was very thick just here hurried on scarcely hearing the words because if you are she wants you the little girl does and i guess they all do said the girl rushing after her where are they cried polly turning on her please be quick and tell me come on i'll take you the girl made her way through the crowd edging along and polly with the color coming back to her cheek that had gone quite white followed as nimbly as she could till here she is here's polly she heard joel's voice and in a minute polly was in their midst her arms around phronsie and cuddling her to her heart's content and after this episode they all settled down to the business of shopping at once all except ben who looked here and there for the small girl who had found polly she had slipped away in the crowd and we didn't even thank her said ben sorrowfully well we must go to some other store and get phronsie's cat said polly as long as we can't find her with a sigh so they all followed ben as he made a way for them through the crowd phronsie clinging to polly's hand as if she never meant to let her go again all at once ben darted aside then turned back to polly there she is he pointed over to the counter where the small girl had her pig and woolly dog once more taking each up affectionately then laying it down well you can't do that all day observed the saleswoman crossly take one or leave it or i'll put em both up again he'd like em both said the small girl my brother would and i don't know which the saleswoman snatched up the pig and reached out an impatient hand for the woolly dog oh polly just hear that whispered ben she wants them for her brother and she was so good to us i know it said polly oh dear i wish she could get them both ben fumbled in his pocket and brought out his brown leather pocketbook you give it to her he said putting a silver half dollar into polly's hand oh wick began joel with his big eyes at the half dollar don't say anything joel said ben hurriedly and dragging him off here just look at that steam engine will you polly shut her fingers over the half dollar and still holding phronsie's hand she leaned over the small shoulder which now she saw was thin and touched the rusty black coat sleeve that's for the woolly dog she said softly so nobody heard and slipping the half dollar into the red hand without any glove on oh my cried the girl staring first at her hand with the silver half dollar shining up at her from the middle of it and then into polly's face what's that for you were so good to us said polly simply and before the girl could say a word she had slipped back to ben and this time they were soon lost in the crowd down the aisle on their way to another shop you've given away a whole half dollar gasped joel staring up into ben's face hush said ben hauling him on as polly flew back well now then we must hurry else we never will get through yes we must get phronsie's cat said polly with a happy little thrill oh ben just think she whispered for ben never could bear to be thanked she's bought that woolly dog by this time i must know do hush begged ben oh now i know you are whispering secrets declared joel trying to crowd in between them no we are not said polly really and truly we are not are we ben then what are you whispering for demanded joel before ben could answer as they all hurried out phronsie announcing gleefully that she was going to buy grandpapa's cat and pulling ben along whose hand she held so that there was no time to peer into the shop windows 
Polly and the boys brought up the rear of the little procession and there sure enough up on the top shelf of the animal department of the next toy shop was a little yellow cat with very green eyes and a pink ribbon around her neck looking down on the five little peppers as if she had expected them all the while as they hurried up to anxiously scan the assortment and oh she had really and truly fur on when she saw that phronsie screamed right out she's there oh i want her and stretched out her arms the money bag dangling merrily as if its services would be wanted presently oh polly i do want her i do and before anyone would believe it it was all done so quickly the little yellow cat was taken down and paid for and phronsie had it in her hand and was stroking its back lovingly and telling it about dear grandpapa and that it was going to him on christmas day and ever so much more ain't you going to have it wrapped up asked the saleswoman here give it to me and the boy'll put a paper on it for you oh no no said phronsie edging away in alarm and cuddling the little yellow cat up in her neck she doesn't want to be wrapped up don't benzie as he tried to take it out of her arms all right said ben with a laugh oh ben she can't carry it all the afternoon in that way said polly disapprovingly it won't do any harm if she does said ben with a glance at her and i don't believe polly she'll put that cat down till we get home he added so out they went joel and david having to be dragged away from the alluring toys at every description on all sides fairly clamoring to be purchased oh i want that steam engine howled joel see dave see i'd rather have the express wagon said david who hadn't been able to take his eyes from it the second he spied it huh old wagon joel exclaimed in contempt a steam engine'll go like this he shot out his arm regardless where it went take care a voice sang out but it was too late over went a pile of toys just purchased from the arms of a cash girl on its way to be wrapped up smash went something a big doll with pink cheeks and very blue eyes and with an awful feeling at his heart joel with everybody else who saw the accident bent over the heap of little pieces on the floor all that remained of the pretty face you broke it declared the cash girl aghast at the mischief and her teeth fairly chattering with fright as she whirled around to joel i didn't mean he began stoutly david looked wildly around for ben and polly they were ahead with phronsie so he ran after them on unsteady feet i didn't mean joel was saying again as they hurried up in great distress oh ben don't let phronsie see said polly as soon as she caught sight of the broken doll for phronsie never could bear to think of one being hurt and she tried to draw her away too late phronsie rushed into the very middle of the group just as the floor walker was protesting of course you didn't do it to joel for it never would do to charge the trouble to rich mr king's household he knew all the children well as they had been many times at the shop with the old gentleman who was one of his best customers oh let me take her begged phronsie eagerly polly can't i oh please give her to me and it was all your own carelessness went on the floor walker sternly fastening his gaze on the cash girl and quite delighted to blame somebody and i shall report you to the office now go ahead with those other things and then come here and pick up these pieces and take the doll back with that he turned off from everybody who had stopped to look at the accident and marched off with the best manner on and his head well in the air oh dear me the cash girl took two or three steps off toward the wrapping counter and began to cry all over the rest of the purchases piled in her arms as she staggered on meantime phronsie had sat down on the floor and was cuddling up the doll without any face against the little yellow cat joel stumbled off after the girl don't cry and he twitched her arm you be still and go right away cried the girl turning on him as well as she could for the pile of bundles as she stamped her foot in rage you've made me smash that doll and they'll take it out of my pay and now i can't get my mother any christmas present at all the tears were rolling down her cheeks and her face worked dreadfully they shan't declared joel his black eyes flashing 
and now you'll make me smash these i suppose said the cash girl you go right away you bad boy you boo hoo hoo i'll tell them i did it said joel bounding off to overtake the floor walker say oh do stop for he had almost reached the office door mr please and he seized the end of the departing coat polly and ben both calling astonished as they saw him fly past to stop hey oh is that you the floor walker smoothed out his face when he saw who it was yes said joel it is and you mustn't make that girl pay for that doll oh don't you worry about that said the floor walker easily with a smile she's a careless thing and i must make an example of her or she'll break something else it's all right my boy and he put his hand where the big diamond ring shone up from his little finger familiarly on the sturdy shoulder it isn't all right declared joel hotly and she didn't do it i knocked her with my arm and that old doll fell off he swallowed hard what an awful hole that would make in his pocketbook perhaps he wouldn't be able to buy only half as many things for his christmas presents as he had scrawled on the list within it and the blood surged all over his round cheeks to his stubby black hair how much did it cost he asked faintly oh you won't have to pay for it said the floor walker smiling pleasantly till he showed his white teeth mr persons would never charge you a cent for it thank you bobbed joel in intense relief that's awfully good and he laughed too and gleefully slapped his pocket till encountering the big pin again he thought better of that and said once more thank you mister in the exuberance of his delight and was moving off oh no indeed repeated the floor walker decidedly he wouldn't ever think of it the girl's got to pay and he turned off too hey cried joel whirling around then he ran back to the tall man's side has that girl got to pay he demanded his black eyes flashing and his eyes working dreadfully say tell me has she why of course said the man don't you worry he won't touch a cent of your money and you keep still i shan't tell him so he won't know anyway well i shall tell him myself said joel in a burst and dashing up to the first door he saw he opened it and plunged in before the floor walker could stop him so ben and polly staring in the direction he had run of course lost track of him and had nothing to do but wait there till he came back joel pranced up to the first desk he saw of which the room appeared to be full and found himself by the side of a young man with a very large head of tow-coloured hair who was doing his best to find the bottom of a long column of figures as he paid no attention to joel's sudden appearance the floor walker had time to add himself to their company at this the young man deserted his figures thrust his pencil in the thicket of tow hair and said hey that you mackenzie but mr mackenzie paid small heed here you don't want to come in here he said to joel i'll fix that up for you but joel not caring to wait for attentions that didn't appear to be forthcoming dashed off to the next door where's the big man he demanded hey the busy worker raised his head in astonishment to stare at the chubby face thrust into his own the big man the one who's ahead of you all said joel impatiently waving his arms around comprehensively to take in the whole counting room oh mr persons i guess he means contributed the man of the neighboring desk by this time everybody in the department had become interested and pens were laid down and heads were bobbed up yes yes cried joel quite delighted to recognize the name that in his excitement had slipped away where is he drumming on the desk impatiently in there kid the bookkeeper stuck his penholder over his shoulder and following its lead joel was soon within a little office that if he had taken time to notice would have showed him private in big letters across the door but joel hadn't time to waste on anything but the matter in hand and he plunged up to the desk and burst out it was all my fault and i want to pay for it don't let him make the little girl pay please don't and laid hold of the gray-haired man's arm at this last and held on with a grip for mr mackenzie hurried up mr persons dropped his pen in astonishment his mouth flew open but he said not a word i'll explain it sir said the floor walker with deference but he had a withering look for joel you see one of the oh don't let him tell it burst in joel in terror and gripping the arm on the desk worse than ever he wants that poor little girl to pay 
he brought his black eyes so close to the gray bearded face that the countenance holding them obscured everything else I'll tell you how it is sir said Mackenzie hastily on the contrary I'll let the boy tell his story said mr. Persons dryly now then what is it my lad and he brought his eyes just as sharp in their way although the palest of blue ones to bear on Joel's face so Joel perfectly happy now that he had the telling of the story in his own way began with great satisfaction and never stopped to draw breath until he turned to pull out his pocketbook then he tugged on mamsie's big shawl pin till he grew quite red in the face at last it was out and so was the money how much is it he cried oh you want to pay for it asked mr persons with a keen look into his flushed face yes sir joel bobbed his black head how much is it he demanded again this time impatiently since it was all settled he began wildly to think of ben and polly and the others mr persons this time the floor walker got back of the big office chair and whispered the information as to who the boy was without Joel's having a word Mr. Persons nodded well he said to Joel his face not moving a muscle you may give me a dollar my lad And we'll consider that everything is all squared up in regard to the injury to that doll So Joel counted out a dollar from his hoarded silver pieces and put them into mr. Persons hand the floor walker staring in amazement at his employer then he fastened up his pocket again sticking mamsie's big shawl pin in tighter than ever All right, thank you sir And he marched through the rows of men at their desks in the big counting room all curiously staring at him as he passed Outside he found Ben and Polly making anxious inquiries of everyone David following closely beyond saying a word and Phronsie who didn't know that he was lost only that the poor sick doll had to be left to get a new head on What have you been about Joe cried Ben for even David was not quite clear how it all had happened Oh something said Joel carelessly craning his neck to look about on all sides. Oh wickets there she is And he was gone again this time in chase of a small cash girl when everything was finally all explained and the cash girl had stepped off with a radiant face Ben drew his charges off into a quiet corner and said quite decidedly See here now. We'll buy grandpapa's present first and make sure of it Yes, do said Polly for we never will get through in all this world. Well, what shall we choose Ben? What do you choose asked Ben looking only at her? Oh? I know I know said Joel eagerly Hush Joe let Polly say I don't know said Polly Polly doesn't know broke in Joel let me tell I know something splendid Ben you be still Joe said Ben and let Polly think Well, I thought perhaps he'd like books said Polly slowly wrinkling up her brows in little puckers Oh exclaimed Joel in great disgust books aren't any good. I know books will be fine Polly said Ben smiling approval anything else for second choice no said polly i can't think of another thing grandpapa has got just every single thing in the world i do believe she brought up with a sigh i heard him say he'd broken his gold pen said ben the other day oh benzy cried polly with sparkling eyes and seizing his arm how perfectly splendid you are to always think up the right things no i don't polly Ben was guilty of contradiction, but his cheek glowed. You always get ahead of me with twenty plans while I'm thinking up one. But your one is the best, laughed Polly, squeezing his arm affectionately. Oh, now let's hurry and buy the gold pen. Well, do you children want it? asked Ben, looking around at them, because it must be something that we all like, else Grandpapa won't care anything for it. Phew! cried Joel horribly disappointed at such a quiet present what's an old pen anyway can't write with it without a handle well we are going to give the handle of course said Ben only it must be a black one for we haven't money enough for a solid gold one and did you suppose we'd give grandpapa a pen without a handle Joey said Polly quite horror-stricken at the very idea well you said pen persisted Joel and so it is pen said Ben gaily his spirits rising fast and handle too well now 
do you vote for it joe and he slapped his back yes said joel if you'll give the handle too and david said yes then polly had to explain it all to phronsie and just think pet you can sit by him at his table and watch him write with it she finished oh i want to buy my dear grandpapa a pen cried phronsie dreadfully excited and hopping up and down do benzy please get it now this very one minute End of chapter 3chapter four of ben pepper this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen ben pepper by margaret sidney it's joel's old lady so a pen was bought and a lovely gold mounted black handle all the children hanging over the purchase in rapt attention and it was left to be marked with grandpapa's initials and to be sent to ben in two days in order to be actually sure to be on hand in time for christmas which now was only a week away for suppose it shouldn't be there in time breathed polly at which the rest of the pepper children took alarm oh won't it gasped joel in distress trying to fly back to the counter as the whole bunch moved away in great delight at this momentous undertaking accomplished here you ben seized his jacket and pulled him back then he slipped away himself while polly reassured joel that she was only supposing that if they hadn't bought grandpapa's present this very day what might have happened so that she didn't see ben go until as he hurried back why where she began looking around nothing said ben answering her question and his face grew red only i thought you'd better have the parcel sent to you for he remembered just in time how dearly polly loved to receive bundles addressed to her own self oh ben exclaimed polly in dismay you shouldn't have done so i'm going back to tell them to change it indeed you won't declared ben bursting into a laugh i guess changing it once is enough come on polly but once outside they couldn't get along for the throng what is it cried david who happened to be first joel hanging back to look at the things on the last counter a fire oh polly it must be a fire joel caught the last word oh good that's prime he cleared the steps with a bound but ben was after him and had him fast it was impossible to see what the commotion was about the people pressing up to the curbstone in such a throng it isn't any fire at all declared joel with a sniff quite willing to be led back by ben there aren't any fire engines or anything come on let's go to gallagher's gallagher's was the best all-round shop in town and it was the children's perfect delight whenever allowed to go there but something has happened said polly standing on her tiptoes and craning her neck to look up the street where the group was the thickest oh dear me it's a woman and she's hurt tried to go across the street and got knocked down volunteered a man who having seen all he wanted to kindly made way for polly to take his place oh dear me she began then she caught sight of the face ben she clutched his sleeve it's joel's old lady sure enough the face now as white as the big puffs of hair above it came into view as two men lifted the owner a big stately woman to the sidewalk they came close to the little peppers so that the stiff black silk coat now plentifully besprinkled with mud brushed them as it passed joel gave a howl as she was carried by it's that cross old woman he exclaimed hush joel polly pulled his arm get out of the way said the men pushing with their burden into the drug store two doors off the bystanders having seen all that satisfied their curiosity rushed off to the delayed christmas shopping only the pepper children were left polly said ben hoarsely and his blue eyes shone just think supposing she belonged to us she couldn't said joel decidedly she's awful cross for shame joel said ben sternly i'm going to see he hurried after just as the men laid down the old woman on the marble floor blessed if i know who she is said one of them wiping his forehead as the perspiration rushed off she run right in front of the wagon i seen her myself said the other well i guess she's dead said the first man 
ben pushed up nearer motioning for the rest of the children who had followed to keep back meantime the proprietor ran to the telephone i would thank you to call my carriage said the old lady the eyes in the white face flying open the two men who had brought her in and the little fringe of spectators principally composed of the druggist's clerks and the little group of peppers tumbled back suddenly she's out of her head said one of the men behind his hand she didn't have no carriage ben pushed by him the old woman's eyes closing again when polly knelt down by her side and forgetting how scared she had been by that face the last time she saw it she seized the poor stiff hand in its black glove oh ma'am she cried can't you tell me who you are and we will get you home the eyes flew wide open again and the face was quite as terrible where she lay on the floor of the druggist's shop the roman nose and the big white puff stood up in such a formidable way oh the keen black eyes bore into polly's face but lift me up and call my carriage was all she said ben heard as did the others and he rushed up to the proprietor just as the doctor a dapper little man with a very big instrument case came importantly in i don't want anything done to me said the old lady viewing the new arrival from head to foot she was now sitting up having made polly help her to that position and see here boy she glanced around for ben i'd thank you to give me a hand and disdaining the proffered assistance of the young medical man she was on her feet and proceeding though somewhat unsteadily toward the door there he is she raised one of her black gloves there's carson pointing to a coachman driving a spirited pair of bays down the street anxiety written all over his florid face as he looked to right and to left here stop him which was easy to do as ben rushed tumultuously out for the coachman turned when down at the corner driving slowly back to scan once more every shop door and the passers-by on either side i thought i'd walk over to summer street said the old lady and i told carson to wait there when the wagon knocked me down meanwhile she clung to polly's hand are you sure madam that you are not hurt the young physician pushed up such an accident as yours should be attended to when i require your services i can inform you said the old lady turning on him with so much vigor that he fell back involuntarily i shall call my own physician when i reach home that's right girl help me to my carriage and clinging to polly's hand she went down the drug shop steps carson ejaculating oh lord in great relief at seeing her and nervously slapping his knee though it had been all her own fault that she was in such a plight hm, she wouldn't groan but it was perilously near it as she got into the carriage with polly's and ben's help and settled back on the cushions with a grimace oh you are hurt cried polly the color dying from her cheek and looking in the window in great concern nonsense said the old woman in her sharpest tone then she drew her breath hard your name girl and your brother she looked inquiringly at ben yes said polly with a glad little smile up at him he's ben what's the last name pepper ben and polly said it together and the three others crowded up to the carriage door crying out we're all peppers hm said the old woman looking them all over but her gaze rested the longest on joel i'm sorry you got hurt he blurted out with a very red face and wishing he had remained in the background and where do you live asked the old woman without the slightest attention to his remark at mr king said ben he's my own dear grandpapa announced phronsie pressing up closely and i bought him a dear little cat holding it as high as she could drive home carson was all the old woman said so carson almost beside himself with delight that she was safely inside went off at his best pace and the carriage was soon lost to view around the corner well said ben she'll be home now with a sigh of relief we must make haste and get to gallagher's when they came out of gallagher's an hour later they were so laden down with bundles little and big for the children insisted on carrying everything home that polly and ben had all they could do what with their own parcels to pilot the three younger ones along everything had gone off splendidly just the right presents had been found and bought and bubbling over with joy the little group 
hurried along to get home to mamsie knocking into everybody and being knocked about in return by big and criss-crossed bundles of every description as their owners endeavored to wind their way along the crowded streets oh dear where is papa doctor cried polly for the third time when the coffee was brought in at dinner and the children who couldn't take any were busy over the nuts and raisins the shopping expedition had been hilariously told by the whole bunch all except phronsie who had been too sleepy to more than mumble to mamsie her purchase of the little cat before she hid it in the under drawer of the big mahogany bureau she wanted dreadfully to take it to bed with her but that would never do as it was to be a christmas gift so she patted it lovingly good-bye and after her nursery tea was popped into bed herself oh dear me polly ended with a sigh for she never felt just comfortable unless she could tell dr fisher everything so half the pleasure of the recital was lost to her he is busy with the case i suppose said mother fisher yet she looked worried and cast an anxious glance at the door working himself to death observed old mr king from the head of the table yet his eyes gleamed with delight just what i said he was revolving in his own mind if he would come to the city he could lead the profession polly gave a little start and grew pale grandpapa doesn't mean that whispered ben don't polly when the door opened and the little doctor marched in head erect and his eyes shining behind their big spectacles well well he declared breezily i thought you'd be through dinner and without a bit of warning he went up to polly's and ben's chairs i don't know which of you children i'm proudest of he began everybody stared and laid down knives and forks while the little doctor as if he had the happiest sort of a tale to unfold when the proper time came nodded over to his wife i've been attending mrs van Bruypen. this time he bobbed his head over toward mr king what is mrs van Bruypen sick asked the old gentleman quickly got knocked down in the street the little doctor brought it out jerkily when the little peppers heard that they all started and joel exclaimed oh and slunk down in his chair wishing he could go under the table while old mr king started a rapid fire of questions little dr fisher skipping into his seat replied as fast as he could till the accident and its result was pretty generally known around the table but what have the children to do with it at last demanded mr king in a puzzled way as he was never able to take his mind off very long from the peppers and their affairs the little doctor burst into a happy laugh he was so pleased and it was so very contagious that before long everybody at the table had joined until anyone looking in would have said well well it's no use to wait for christmas to be jolly for here we are as merry as a greek now i don't know in the least what i'm laughing at said old mr king at last but you are enough fisher to start us off always now be so good as to tell me what it is all about and he wiped his eyes why the old lady mrs van Rupen, whatever her name is wasn't so very much hurt said ben his blue eyes shining and it's so very lovely grandpapa cried polly her cheeks very red and clapping her hands even if she were at the table it's prime shouted joel coming up straight in his chair his black eyes shining but at the next remark down he slid again wishing he hadn't said anything oh it isn't that said dr fisher quickly i'm glad enough i can fix the old lady up but it's my children then he set his glasses straight which had slipped down his nose and beamed affectionately on the four faces mrs fisher slipped her hand on his tired one as it rested on his lap what is it adoniram she asked why that old i mean mrs van Rupen, i should w just as soon think of a stone gate post breaking out says our children helped her and she's overcome with gratitude think of it mary that old stone post oh cried joel burrowing deeply till his face was almost obscured and she can't say enough about them wants them to come over to-morrow ugh with that joel wholly disappeared sliding down under the table where are you going joe ben exclaimed and the butler hurrying over joel was soon drawn out and installed once more on his chair this time he was the centre for all eyes oh joel mother fisher's delight which had spread over her face died out so suddenly that joel blurted out dreadfully distressed i didn't mean to mamsie and he choked back the tears not to add to his disgrace 
brighten up joel said little dr fisher cheerily we'll forgive him this time mary for mrs van ruypen sent her love to him and particularly wants him to come to-morrow and no no howled joel this time all lost to control i was bad to her and every bit of blood rushed up to his brown face why she says she was bad to you observed the little doctor demurely anyway you are to go with the others to-morrow joe so it's all right my boy end of chapter four chapter five of ben pepper this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org ben pepper by margaret sidney the presents all go from santa claus joel protested up to the very last that he couldn't go to see the big lady in the black silk coat but maybe she won't have it on said david who had been anxiously hanging on joel's every word and surveying his round countenance in fear supposing joel shouldn't really go this would be worse than all and david clasped and unclasped his hands nervously of course she won't have it on exclaimed polly briskly why the very idea she wouldn't wear that in the house now you see joel cried david much relieved and his face brightening she won't really for polly said so well you've got to go anyway declared ben in a downright way there was no mistaking so say no more joe but get your cap the other pepper children were all in a bunch in the wide hall revolving around joel who felt as long as he postponed getting his coat and cap he was surely safe from the awful expedition but now seeing ben's blue eyes upon him he set out for the closet in the back hall where the boys outer garments were kept grumbling at every step oh dear me this is too dreadful for anything sighed polly sinking down on the last step of the stairs when phronsie saw her do this she hurried over and snuggled up in her fur-trimmed coat as close as she could get to her side i wish jasper was home said ben with a long breath and going across to stand in front of the two so we wish all the time said polly but then he can't come till friday and that's just for ever little david left alone thought the best thing he could do would be to run after joel so he precipitated himself upon that individual who just knocking down his cap from its hook was beginning to prowl around the floor in the corner of the closet can't find it growled joel knocking off more things in his irritation oh let me cried david delighted to help let me joel i'll get it you keep off cried joel lifting a hot red face i'll get it myself and i won't go to see that old woman he declared savagely oh yes you must joe cried david in alarm i won't i won't i won't declared joel feeling with each repetition of the word a happy independence yes indeed the children have gone a voice suddenly proclaimed above the stairs as somebody opened the door and came out into the upper hall yes mrs whitney they have gone to mrs van ruppen's it's mamsie gasped david clutching joel's shoulder who ducked back into his corner so suddenly that they both went down in a little heap did she hear gasped joel holding his breath for the answer i don't believe so said david when he could extricate himself from joel sufficiently who now grasped him by both hands in a way very uncomfortable for conversation no i don't really believe she did joel cause she said we'd gone she'll hear us now anyway said joel thrust into the depths of gloom his independence completely deserting him what'll we do little david found his feet and tiptoed out to listen under the stairs she's going into her room he announced in a whisper coming back to the closet come joey do hurry so joel picked up his cap and crammed it on his head and stepped out of the closet but he had a very gloomy air when the two boys presented themselves in the front hall oh there now you see said polly to ben quite in despair just how very dreadful it's all going to be when joel goes with such a face oh come on said ben setting his lips tightly together so polly and phronsie got off from the stair and if the expedition was not begun in hilarity it was at least started but when they reached the big house of mrs van ruppen that loomed up across the square like a heavy dark brown fortress the situation was much worse i'm not going in declared joel all his terrors returning and he planted his feet firmly on the pavement 
determined not to go up the first step. How it was done, he never knew, but the next moment he was at the top of the flight under Ben's hands, who released him enough to ring the bell, and the butler, answering the summons, Joel was really the first person to enter, which he did with a bound, as if extremely eager to get in. And then, it was all like a dream. They were ushered into a reception room, high and dark and gloomy, and told to take off their things, for Madam would receive them upstairs. In the excitement of it all, Polly, while undoing Phronsie's coat and taking off her bonnet, forgot all about Joel, and it wasn't really until after they had mounted the long stairs that she had the first thought about him. And then, oh dear me, there stood Madame Van Rupen, with a long white hand, barely blazing with rings, outstretched to welcome them. Where's the other boy? she demanded, looking over the group. He came, said Polly faintly, growing quite scarlet at such dreadful manners in one of her family, for which she felt responsible. He really did, ma'am. Impossible, exclaimed Madame Van Rupen. You can see for yourself he's not here. And her face fell. Ben said never a word, but dashed down the long flight. There was Joel, the picture of gloom, on one of the big chairs in the reception room. He had run back after Ben supposed that he was at his heels, and found the only refuge he could think of. "'You're a nice boy,' said Ben, picking him off from his chair. "'Now march, Joe,' and he kept him well in front of him, and at last there he was, and Madame Van Rupen had taken his hand. But he didn't look at her. "'Well, at least you're all here,' she was saying. "'Now I'm going to tell you what I wanted you for.' No one of the five little peppers appeared to breathe, except Phronsie, who chirped out, "'Oh, we've come all this way to see you.' "'Yes, yes, I know,' said Madame Van Rupen, who was vastly pleased at that, and she nodded her head, that had a ponderous affair of lace and jet upon it, down toward Phronsie. "'But there was something I especially wanted of you, and I'll tell it in one word. You must choose the toys I'm going to send to some poor children.' Without another word, she turned and swung the door wide to another room, and there, before their entranced eyes, was Toyland. Joel took one look and howled out, "'Oh, I will! Let me! Let me!' bounding in. "'So you shall,' said Madame Van Rupen, laughing heartily. "'There, get in there, all of you, and set to work.' There was no need to tell them this, and they were soon running about, not pausing long at any spot, for the attractions overflowed on tables and chairs, and even the carpet appeared to be covered with the best specimens of toys from all the shops in town. But Phronsie went directly over and sat down in front of a big doll and gazed at her without a word. "'Oh, it's just like Gallagher's!' cried Polly, flying about with sparkling eyes, and she clasped her hands. "'Oh, what richness!' "'Ha! Huh, it's better than Gallagher's,' retorted Joel, in scorn, who had always thought that shop was the very finest place imaginable. "'Dave, here's the steam engine, the very one!' he cried, spying it in a corner." Madame Van Rupen laughed again, and this time it seemed as if she was not going to stop. And pretty soon the whole room looked as if Santa Claus himself had been there with his load, while as for the babble of voices, well, it was exactly like a flock of blackbirds all chattering together. "'You said they were going to poor children,' said Polly, at last, flying up to the tall figure, that now it seemed as if they had known all their lives. "'Oh, do tell us about it.' "'So I will.' Madame Van Rupen swept off the articles from the big easy chair, preparatory to sitting down. "'Let me,' said Ben, coming up in his slow way. But the toys were half off, and Polly had gathered up the rest, and the big figure was already in the chair. "'You see,' she began. "'Oh, would you please wait?' begged Polly, in great distress, looking over across the room where Joel and David were deep in the charms of some mechanical toy. "'Yes, to be sure,' said Madame Van Rupen, good-naturedly, while Polly ran over to them. "'Boys, come!' she cried hurriedly. "'Something's the matter with this pig,' said Joel, not looking at her, and fussing with the animal in question. "'Well, put it down,' said Polly, impatiently. "'She's going to tell us what she wants us to do.' "'Then Dave will get my pig,' said Joel, with one eye asked at that individual. "'Oh, no, he won't touch it, will you, Davy?' said Polly. "'Do put it down, Joe, and come along.' "'No, I won't,' said David. "'Touch it a single bit.' So Joel laid the pig down carefully, and the two boys hurried after Polly. Madame Van Rupen now began again. Phronsie ought to hear, said Joel, as he crowded up. Hush, said Ben, looking over at her where she sat, still absorbed in the big doll. You let her be, Joel, and keep still. 
I have had so much trouble over every Christmas, said Madame Van Rupen, proceeding briskly, selecting presents for some children I happen to know about, who ought to have them, that really sometimes I wish there wasn't any Christmas. Wish there wasn't any Christmas? Every one of the Peppers who heard those direful words tumbled back in dismay and gazed at her in amazement. I really did, but I don't now, Madame Van Rupen drew a long breath, and she laughed again. Well, here we are, and this Christmas I mean to have an easy time, for I'm not to select a single thing myself, but put all the responsibility on you young people. Do you really mean, cried Polly Pepper, crowding up quite closely with flushed cheeks, that we can pick out the toys and things for you to give to your poor children? Oh, do you mean it? To be sure, bless you, yes. Why, that is just why I got you over here, and what I've had this room turned into a toy shop for. She waved her long white hands over at the array. Oh, oh, Joel! Polly seized the arm next to her and gave it a little tweak. Do begin, for she wants us to pick out the things she is to send to the poor children. I am going to choose that workbox and that backgammon board and... And Polly ran off and was deep in a dozen things at once. Ho, oh, I'm not, said Joel, who couldn't bear backgammon. I am going to choose my pig when I fix him so he'll squeak, and my steam engine. Yes, sir, that's best of all and immediately the entire room was in a bustle. Ben turned off with the others, but presently came slowly back to stand a minute at Madame Van Rupen's chair, where she sat with folded hands. Well, what is it? she asked, looking up into his face. Were you picking out toys for the poor children when we saw you yesterday? asked Ben, looking at her steadily. Dear me, yes, what do you suppose could have induced me to go into such a mob? cried Madame Van Rupen. Oh, said Ben, and he turned back and set to work on doing what he could to pick out the things he should want, if he were really a poor boy, not likely to get presents in any other way. But the nicest of all things, so he thought, thick boots, mittens, and fur tippets to keep out the cold, were not there, and he stifled a sigh and gave his mind to do the best he could under the circumstances. Something is the matter, I see. He didn't know it, but there the old lady was, close by his side and the next words showed clearly that she had discovered what was on his mind. Out with it, Ben, for that's your name, I believe. Yes, said Ben, it is. Well, you might as well tell me, for I see very plainly that you don't think I've had the right thing sent up from the stores. What would you send to poor children for their Christmas? I think a boy would like a pair of boots, said Ben slowly, and he came to the conclusion that he might as well tell the whole. Or a thick coat, or some mittens, and a tippet. But those wouldn't be Christmas presents. Those are everyday things, said the old lady, sharply. They wouldn't be his everyday things, said Ben sturdily. Oh, perhaps that is so, said Madame Van Rupen thoughtfully. Well, let's see. She took up some books, whirled the pages a minute to give herself some time to think. Then she pushed them all away impatiently. You go on and choose what you think some boys would like out of the things that are here, as we haven't any clothes among them. Then she turned away and swept back into her seat. And Ben, feeling very sure that the wrong thing had been said by him, set to work, as best as he might, to do as she wanted. When the task was over, it seemed as if all the toys and gay articles had been chosen, every one. They are all perfectly beautiful, sighed Polly, and we can't leave any out. So I am to send them all, said Madame Van Rupen, much pleased to think that her experiment in having the things sent up was so approved, and looking around at them all. Oh, yes, yes, they cried. Joel especially was separating that not a single one was to be omitted. Now that he had discovered the weak part in the pig's voice and had fixed it to his satisfaction, everything was all right. Please give her to the poor child, begged Francie, who had the whole thing explained to her by Polly, and coming up with very pink cheeks to hold as high as she could the big doll. Oh, do, please do, and give it right away. Oh, I shall not give it, said Madame Van Rupen decidedly. A quiver came into Francie's voice, and her lip drooped, and she looked as if she were going to cry. Please, she began. Santa Claus is going to take it to her, said the old lady, making haste to explain when she saw Francie's face. Don't you be afraid, child. The poor little girl will get her doll. Oh, then I'm glad, said Francie, beginning to smile, and two little tears that were just starting out determined to go back again. Then she laughed gleefully. Polly, Polly, she cried in great excitement. The big lady is going to take it to the poor little girl. She is, Polly. She said so. I shan't take it, said Madame Van Rupen, nodding over to Polly. 
The little girl won't know it's from me, but she'll have it all the same. Shan't you tell her you sent it? demanded Joel, who had caught the words and whirling around suddenly. Shan't you tell her about any of the things? waving his hands in all directions. Of course not, declared Madame Van Rupen. Dear me, not for the world, Joel. Would I have them know where the things come from? The presents all go from Santa Claus. Oh, said Joel. And now you don't know, you can't even guess, said Madame Van Rupen, what a load you've taken on my mind by coming here to help me. Have we? cried Polly with glistening eyes. Oh, so much, declared the old lady. I haven't, said Joel. I've only had a good time. And patting his steam engine lovingly. Then he set it off once more. Wee, whiz, see her go, he cried. Stop, Joey, we're all through, said Polly. And it's time to go, said Ben. And send him tonight, do, said Joel, deserting his engine abruptly to march up to the old lady. Oh, Joel, cried Polly, much ashamed. And tell the boy who gets the pig to turn him upside down when the squeak won't come, said Joel, no wise abashed. Come on, Joe, said Ben, picking his sleeve. Oh, wait a moment, Ben, said Madame Van Rupen, laying a detaining hand on his arm as the others said goodbye and filed downstairs to get coats and hats on. I think myself it might be advisable to add a few things to wear to these presents, and I want you to go tomorrow afternoon with me to choose them, will you? And Ben said, yes, quite overwhelmed with the thought. He was actually going shopping with Madame Van Rupen. End of The Presents All Go from Santa Claus Chapter 6 of Ben Pepper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ben Pepper by Margaret Sidney. Ben goes shopping with Madame Van Rupen. All the rest of the Peppers crowded up to the windows to watch Ben go off in state in the Van Rupen carriage, Phronsie climbing up on a chair to see him the better. As for Ben himself, he was so amazed at the whole thing to think that he was by Madame Van Rupen's side and expected to give his opinion as to matters and things that for some minutes he had all he could do to keep his attention on what she was saying. You see, Ben, at last he made out, I don't know in the least what to get for a boy, and if it were not for you, I shouldn't think of such a thing as to pick out clothes for one. Well, here we are, as Carson drew up to a large tailoring establishment. We'll go in and do our best, but it must be you who does the selecting. Ben, with an awful feeling at his heart at all this responsibility, stumbled after her as she marched down the long store, the salesmen all vying with each other to attract her attention and wait upon her. She didn't notice any of them, but kept on her way, her Roman nose and white puffs of hair held well up, until at the end of the aisle a little dapper man stepped up, rubbing his hands obsequiously together, and stopped her progress. "'Anything I can show you, madam?' he said with a bow and a flourish. Madame Van Rupen looked him all over carelessly. "'Oh, well, I suppose you can. This boy here,' she turned to Ben, "'understands what I want. Now then, Ben, speak up and tell the man, for I know nothing about it.' But that she looked round for a chair, which the little dapper man, hurrying off, soon brought, and, sitting down, she drew up her stately figure to its full height and left Ben to his own devices. I suppose it must be a coat, began Ben. Oh, if Mamsie were only there. Instead was the big figure in the black silk coat, whose eyes had such a way of boring right through one that it seemed to take the breath away of the one being inspected. I suppose so, said the lady. As we have come for clothes, why a coat appears to be essential, and if I were to express an opinion, I should consider that the rest of the suit would be a good investment, too. Quite right, assented the shopman. Now I will show you some. This way, madam. Here, stay, and I will move your chair. You will do nothing of the sort, said Madame Van Rupen shortly. This is not to be in my purchasing. The boy will attend to it for me. Ben, you go along with the man and select the articles. Do you mean I'm... Do you mean I'm to... Do you mean I'm to go without you, ma'am? asked Ben, quite aghast at the very idea, his blue eyes very wide. Of course, said the old lady, having hard work not to laugh. I said so, I believe. But... But I may not pick out the right things, stammered Ben. I'll trust you, said Madame Van Rupen, waving him off summarily. So as there was nothing else to do, Ben followed the little man down what seemed an interminable number of aisles, 
at last pausing before a set of drawers on either hand of which was a cabinet with doors now here said the salesman swinging wide one of the doors is just the thing it's for yourself i suppose and he took down with a deft hand a jacket and a pair of trousers oh no it isn't ben made haste to say answering the question hey oh the little man whirled around to stare at him your brother then no said ben growing hot and red in the face it isn't for any of us no one i know she's going to give them away to some boy who he was going to say needs them but the salesman shut off the words from his mouth and clapping to the door led the way off down another aisle to a counter where the suits were piled high i've got just the very thing for you here he announced twitching one out there now see that but that is much too nice said ben putting his fingers on the fine goods and wishing he were anywhere else in the world but in that store and the perspiration began to trickle in little drops down his face so the salesman leaned his hands meditatively on the counter and surveyed him well i'll show you some other goods come this way and again they traversed some more aisles took an elevator and went up what seemed to bend a great many floors at last coming out at a department which as far as the eye could see was stacked with thick ready-made goods of serviceable materials there said the little man giving quick bird-like glances on either side and at last pausing he slapped his hand smartly down on a small pile of suits it is just the ticket for you yes said ben as he ran his hand approvingly over the thick surface i guess it is it looks good and it is good said the salesman emphatically it will outwear three of those other ones downstairs we have it but a few of these left now how big is the boy you want it for i don't know said ben helplessly well we've got to have something to go by said the salesman of course you can't buy at random and haphazard she didn't say said ben with a nod over in the direction supposed to be where madame van rupen was waiting several floors below for the transaction to be completed but she's going to give them to a boy he added desperately and so i guess i'll pick out the very best you have for the money and it'll be right they'll fit some boy right you are declared the salesman delighted to have the matter satisfactorily arranged and pulling out a coat and a jacket he held them up before ben's eyes now that is the best money value we've got in the store fact we're closing them out couldn't afford to give them at this low figure but there's only these few left and we don't allow remnants to bother us long no sir he rattled on so fast that ben who was slowly going over the coat which he had by this time gotten into his own hands in a close examination as to buttons and buttonholes only half heard him indeed it wasn't in the least necessary for he hadn't held the garment for a moment before he knew quite well that here was a good bargain and one well fitted to warm some poor boy and to wear well you can't find fault said the little man in great satisfaction when the whole suit had been gone over in this slow way cause there ain't any well do you want it how much is it asked ben nine fifty it's worth three dollars more but we're closing them out as i told you and we don't give room to remnants it's a bargain if ever there was one fact do you want it yes if she says so said ben and now his spirits quite rose for it was a good thing and he was not ashamed to show up to madame van rupen or to anyone else as his selection so the salesman flung the suit over his arm and skipped off followed by ben and they shot down the elevator and went back down the aisles there she sat stiff and immovable in her chair oh only one she asked as the salesman held up the bargain i didn't know you wanted two gasped ben you didn't say so oh i suppose i did not mention it but have you been all this time picking out a paltry one she didn't even offer to touch the suit and scarcely glanced at it do you like it asked ben see it's thick and warm isn't it lifting the sleeve for her to see it better oh i suppose it will serve its purpose and be warm enough she said carelessly well now to the salesman will you go back and bring another one a smaller size and stay still another for there must be some more boys in the family there ought to be no you don't need to go ben he can pick them out just the same quality mind and she dismissed the little man when he had disappeared she cast an approving glance at the suit thrown across the counter very well chosen she said and now see here run down to the neckwear counter or stay and she raised her black glove a small army of salesmen seemed to rush to the scene so many appeared what is it madam for all knew at least by sight the wealthy old lady who try as hard as she might never seemed to be able to make much impression on the van rupen money bags take this boy to the different departments that he selects and let him buy what pleases him she said to the first salesman that reached her 
yes madam he said well pleased and leading off with ben but just then a floor walker touched him on the shoulder mr moses wants you he said about those vests oh all right said the salesman here perkins and beckoning to a tall young man who appeared to ben very much dressed up he turned the boy over to him and went off well what do you want asked mr perkins leisurely surveying ben's sturdy figure from his greater height a red woolen tippet i think said ben a red woolen tippet repeated the salesman nearly falling backward oh we haven't got one in the store haven't you asked ben very much disappointed for he had set his heart on seeing that the boy who was to have those good warm clothes should have a red woolen tippet to tie around his throat and perhaps go over his cap and down around his ears if it was very cold anyway the ends were to tuck in the jacket ben knew just exactly how that tippet was to look when it was all fixed ready for a sharp cold snowy day well i can suit you said the salesman noting the disappointed tone we've got silk scarves nice ones all oh i don't want a silk scarf said ben quickly some of them are plaid you don't know how fine they are this way and he stepped off but as ben stood quite still there was nothing for the salesman to do but to come back which he did quite discomfited have you got any caps asked ben leaving the red tippet out of the question as an impossibility in this shop caps oh yes this way and away they went down aisles up in elevators and into the department where nothing but headgear showed itself this time knowing there were to be three boys provided for with suits ben picked out the same number of goods strong caps the salesman all through the process plainly showing his disgust and disappointment at what he thought was to be a fine purchase turning out to be such a poor trade but ben knew nothing of what was going on in the other one's mind and would have cared still less had he known all his attention being absorbed in the bargain he was making for madame van rupen at last the business was concluded do you keep gloves he asked as they turned away yes said the salesman sullenly and slapping the three cloth caps together disdainfully mittens asked ben no indeed said mr perkins emphatically mittens the very idea then he winked at a young man who looked as if a wrinkle by any chance never existed in his clothes and whose hair was evidently just fresh from the barber's we don't keep anything but first-class goods the other young man made no attempt to conceal his broad smile and by this time ben had considerable attention down the long store he couldn't help but see it and he held his head high and his blue eyes flashed well give me the money mr perkins held out his hand the one with the big ring on i don't pay for them said ben well i guess you do young man declared mr perkins in a high key designed to impress the onlookers you've bought these caps and he gave them another disdainful slap together and you'll pay for them and now right sharp off he added in a very unpleasant way but i haven't bought them for myself said ben hey oh what are you talking about mr perkins whirled around at him who sent you here anyway glaring down at him i haven't been sent said ben i came with the one who's going to buy them well who is he take me to him mr perkins craned his neck this way and that trying to see the friend of his customer if you will follow me you will see for yourself said ben stepping off when he paused by madame van rupen's chair mr perkins was in a bad state his long limbs seemed wobbling under him and his usually glib tongue appeared to be fastened to the roof of his mouth he delivered up the caps with a limp and feeble hand then cast an appealing eye down at ben very good said the old lady without a glance at them put them with these other articles pointing to the suit left on the counter now then ben are these all the things you can find here pray tell yes said ben they don't seem to keep what i want in this shop let me look again cried mr perkins in great distress i think maybe i can find something to suit you don't go yet i almost know we can find something he kept on in such misery saying the same thing over and over that madame van rupen stared at him in amazement meanwhile the other young man who had followed ben and mr perkins with his eye till they arrived at madame van rupen's chair soon spread the astounding news that the boy who wanted mittens had good reason to hold his own against everybody and was by no means a person to be safely laughed at and perkins is having a fit he wound up to the group of salesmen unencumbered by customers i don't think you can said ben quickly i must try some other shop but just come and let me show you some things begged mr perkins in a frenzy oh go along ben said madame van rupen you might as well for i must wait here until the other man brings down those extra suits 
so ben had nothing to do but to move off with mr perkins when they had turned into a convenient corner see here said the salesman and his face paled you won't tell on me will you his mouth twitched and anxious wrinkles seemed to run all over his face making him suddenly quite old and worn what do you think said ben indignantly and he turned on his heel in contempt you see mr perkins hurried after him and spoke as if his throat were parched and the words came out so jerkily i couldn't stay here a minute you know if the old man knew i treated any one belonging to her badly i don't belong to her said ben well you came with her said mr perkins quite willing now to believe ben much higher up yet if that were possible in the social scale and i've got a mother he swallowed hard with a kind of choke and three sisters and you needn't be afraid ben stopped the rest i give you my word i'll not speak of it honest injun now said mr perkins anxiously i've given you my word said ben that's all i'll say looking at him squarely mr perkins drew a long breath and the wrinkles seemed to drop right out of his face thank you he said now if you'll come this way i'll show you some things that you want when the two joined the old lady there was quite an array of articles in mr perkins hands which he did not slap disdainfully together to be sure there were no mittens but there were some thick cloth gloves and a stout large handkerchief and some heavy stockings and as the other two suits had been brought down from the top floor there was quite a respectable pile of purchases to be done up and put in the handsome brogum waiting at the door and mr perkins insisted also on seeing them out although the first salesman by his manner proclaimed it quite unnecessary and the tall young man's thank you was said last of all and he appeared to look only at ben quite a gentle-mannered young man observed madame van rupen as the carriage door was closed such a contrast to the ordinary pert creature i shall make an excuse to shop there again and i shall insist upon having him wait on me well now ben while we are driving to birdsall's where you can maybe get the articles you couldn't find here let us think up some boys to give these things to she pointed to the bundle in the opposite seat which more for the pleasure of actually carrying it home than because of the christmas rush she had decided to take with her don't you know the boys you're going to give the clothes to exclaimed ben turning in great astonishment to gaze at her dear me no said madame van rupen with a laugh but that doesn't make any matter there are boys enough who will like those things i haven't any doubt i only thought seeing you've been such a help to me in buying them that perhaps you'd think of the boys to fit them too well there's the city missionary society they'll tell me probably ben removed his gaze from the white puffs and the roman nose and looked steadily out the window gone seemed the city buildings and the streets to give place to country lanes with here and there a farmhouse to break the stretch of long snow-covered roads if only he dared to say his thought as long as you can't help me madame van rupen's voice had a little break in it as if she were not somehow finding quite as much satisfaction in the expedition as she had hitherto enjoyed why i suppose why don't you send them to a country boy cried ben whirling suddenly around on the green leather seat his blue eyes shining hey what why began the old lady then there was an awful pause and just as ben had made up his mind that the whole morning expedition had been made a failure and by him she broke out i have the very thing and ben there are three boys in that family only think i've forgotten them all this time since i saw them up in the mountains last summer ben drew a long breath and his face said do tell me about them though he couldn't say a word there isn't much to tell said the old lady in a shamefaced way for being boys i didn't somehow get interested in them their mother did my washing when i was at the hotel their father had died you see oh said ben and now it comes to me though i did not think much of it at the time that the people at the hotel said the boys that is the two older ones had to walk three miles to school every day it was only a little settlement you see madame van rupen didn't add that she had sent some money to the mother on hearing this story and then straightway forgot all about the matter so now oh ben just think what you made me remember and we'll make the box just as big as we can what do you want to buy now she turned on him eagerly mittens said ben promptly and a red woolen tippet end of ben goes shopping with madame van rupen chapter seven of ben pepper this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Ben Pepper by Margaret Sidney. Chapter 7. 
"'Where's Pip?' and Jasper turned back. "'Something is the matter,' cried Polly, hoarsely. "'Oh, Ben, I know there is.' She rushed up to him in the hall and seized his arm. "'Nonsense,' said Ben, but his cheek paled, and his blue eyes, usually so steady, didn't look at her. If Polly were frightened, something dreadful must have happened. "'There is, there is,' repeated Polly, quite wildly, "'for Auntie Whitney has gone to Grandpapa, and there's a telegram come, and, oh, Ben, can it be Jasper?' With that, Polly held so tightly to the sturdy arm she had grasped that at another time Ben would have cried, "'Hands off, Polly!' This time he didn't even feel it. "'Oh, no, Polly,' was all he could say reassuringly, yet his knees knocked together and everything for a moment seemed to swim before his eyes. "'I saw it myself. It was a telegram that Jane had.' Polly was saying, between little sobs that cut Ben through and through like a knife, and Christmas, and she could get no farther. See here, Polly. Ben came to his senses enough to shake himself free. Then he threw his arms around her and held her fast. Don't let us act like this until we know for sure. I'm going to find out. With that, he rushed off, and Polly, too wild with distress to be left alone, stumbled after him down the hall as he hurried to find Jane. That individual was huddled down in a corner of the back hall, which she fondly supposed cleverly concealed her, her apron up to her eyes, and mumbling something behind it to herself. Ben precipitated himself so suddenly upon her that there was no time for recovery of her composure. She dashed down the apron to look up at him and also see Polly at his heels. "'Oh, my!' she began, dreadfully frightened at the sight of the two she most dreaded to meet at this moment. "'You might as well tell us, Jane,' said Ben, swallowing very hard, and he reached out and seized Polly's hand. "'Because we know some bad news came. Now what is it?' If Polly had pinched his arm in her fright, it was nothing compared to the grip he now gave her fingers, without his knowing it, while she threw her arm around his neck and held on. "'Oh, my gracious!' Jane shook with fright, but she saw no way out of it but to tell, so she added, twisting her apron end into a ball, "'Yes, it did come. Oh, me! Oh, my!' "'It is about Jasper,' said Ben, quietly." "'How do you know, Master Ben?' cried Jane, in astonishment, remembering how she had become possessed of the news, which yet couldn't have traveled through the house. "'Never mind. What is it?' demanded Ben sharply. "'Be quick now, Jane. You might as well tell us first as last.' "'Oh, me!' cried Jane, deserting the apron end to wring her hands desperately. "'I wish I hadn't listened. Oh, I can't tell you. Don't make me.' "'Jane!' Ben leaned over her as well as he could for Polly hanging to him. "'You've just got to tell us, so you might as well be quick about it. Don't you see you're only making us feel worse?' As Ben wasn't given to long speeches, Jane had time to look up in surprise at his face, and then she made up her mind to tell the whole story. "'If you must know, but don't let him blame me, cause I told you,' she burst out. "'You shan't be blamed,' promised Ben. "'Go on.' "'Well, there's been a fire at the school, and Master Jasper's hurt, burned, I guess, and—' "'Ben!' a voice rang through the hall. "'Oh, mercy me!' Jane bounded to her feet, seized her feather duster, which implement she had been wielding when the fatal telegram had been handed in, and scuttled down the back hall. "'Ben! Ben! Does anyone know where he is?' It was Auntie Whitney— whose gentle voice was never heard on such a key, and she was actually running down the hall, her pretty face all streaked with tears. "'Oh, Ben, there isn't a moment to lose. Father wants you to go with him to Jasper. I can't tell you what for.' "'I know,' said Ben quietly, while Polly stuffed her fingers into her mouth to keep from screaming. Mrs. Whitney didn't stop to express any surprise, but her face looked relieved that he had heard the news." "'And you must catch the next train,' she hurried on, her voice breaking. "'Oh, Ben, you must.' "'I'm ready,' cried Ben. He gave Polly one kiss, then pulled her arms away from his neck. 
Your mother says you can go, and she is getting your things together. I'll, I'll help put them up, said Polly, blindly staggering off after him as he rushed down the hall. No, no, Polly, cried Mrs. Whitney. Your mother said you must stay with me, and Polly, I need you so badly. She opened her arms, and Polly ran into them, and though there wasn't very much comforting done, it was good to be together. And Thomas whirled up to the door, and Mr. King and Ben and Mr. King's valet got into the carriage, into which portmanteaus were thrown, and away the horses sprang in a mad rush to make the train, and it was all done in such bewildering haste that the group in the hall scarcely knew or understood anything until the big front door shut with a clang, and they were alone, and nothing to tell of it all but that dreadful yellow telegram lying on Mr. King's writing-table just where it had been thrown. Fire at school dormitory early this morning. Your son Jasper hurt. Come at once. Jacob A. Presbury. Polly never knew for long weeks afterward just how she got through that dreadful day, except that Joel and David had to be soothed, no one being able so well as herself to stop the howls of the former, who, on hearing the news, threw himself flat on the floor in a corner of Grandpapa's writing-room, refusing all comfort. Little David crouched closely to him, and with never a word laid his head on his shoulder. And afterward Polly found herself installed as Mrs. Whitney's little nurse, sitting upon the bed most of the time, and smoothing the soft, fair hair as it lay on the pillow with a trembling hand. "'You can't know what a comfort you are to me, Polly,' every once in a while Mrs. Whitney would say, and reaching up a hand to feel for Polly's fingers. "'Am I?' said Polly, careful not to let the tears drop where they could be seen. "'Yes, indeed. And, oh, Polly, I don't really believe that we ought to think the worst. God wouldn't let anything happen to our Jasper. He wouldn't, Polly.' But Mrs. Whitney clutched the pillow, and turned her face into it, and sobbed. And Polly smoothed her hair, and said not a word. And all those terrible hours passed away. How, no one could tell. Outside they could hear Phronsie, who, of course, knew nothing of the blow that had fallen upon the household, gaily laughing and chattering away. She had been told that Grandpapa had gone away, and that she must not go into his room— so she hadn't seen Joel and David, but Mother Fisher had hard work to keep the incessant calls for Polly from being sounded over the halls and stairs, and at last she took Phronsie into her room and closed the door. "'Now, Mother's baby,' said Mrs. Fisher, seating herself on the wide haircloth sofa and drawing Phronsie into her lap. How often had Jasper sat on this old sofa and told her his boyish confidences the same as her own children. She gave a groan at the thought of what might be happening now at that distant school. "'What is it, Mamsie?' asked Phronsie, in gentle surprise, and lifting a soft little hand to her mother's cheek. "'Oh, my pet!' Mrs. Fisher drew Phronsie quickly to her breast. "'You mustn't mind, Mamsie.' "'But you made a funny noise here, Mamsie.' and Phronsie touched her mother's throat. "'Did I? Well, never mind, dear. Now I must tell you, you cannot have Polly today, Phronsie.' "'But I want Polly,' said Phronsie, regarding her mother with grave displeasure. "'Yes, I know, dear, but you cannot have her just today. Mother does not think it is best.' Phronsie's lip quivered and her brown eyes closed to squeeze the tears back. But despite all her efforts, they would come, and two big ones rolled down her cheeks. "'And Mamsie will be very much disappointed in her little girl if she cries,' went on Mrs. Fisher, "'for Auntie Whitney needs Polly today, so Phronsie must be brave and let Polly stay with her.' "'Is Auntie Whitney sick?' asked Phronsie, with sudden interest, her eyes flying open at once. For any one to be sick was to enlist her sympathy— and she at once gave up all thoughts of having Polly to herself. "'Yes, that is, she will be, I am afraid, if Polly does not stay with her,' said Mother Fisher. "'So you must be a good child, and not call for Polly.' 
"'I will be good,' said Phronsie, sliding down from her mother's lap and folding her hands. "'I will be good.' She bobbed her yellow head. "'And Auntie Whitney will get all well, because Polly is there.' Meanwhile, the train bearing Mr. King and Ben was speeding swiftly on its way. For the first hour the old gentleman sat erect on his chair, gazing straight before him at the flying landscape, and with never a word for his companion. Then he suddenly turned with a little groan, and laid his hand on Ben's shoulder. "'You are such a comfort to me,' he said brokenly. "'Am I?' said Ben, all the color rushing to his face. "'He a comfort to Grandpapa. He hadn't gotten over wondering what had given him this honor of being allowed to go with him, and now to think of being a comfort. "'What I should have done without you, Ben, I cannot tell,' Grandpapa was saying, his hand slipping down until it rested on Ben's woolen glove. "'But, oh, my boy, I am so glad I have you.' Ben said never a word. He couldn't have spoken, it seemed to him, to save his life, but he lifted his blue eyes to the white, drawn face, and old Mr. King did not seem to feel anything lacking. And so, on and on, the revolutions of the wheels, the flashing in and out of strange cities, the long, steady, tireless plunge of the heavily laden express by river and lake, hilltop and plain, only rang one refrain through every heart-throb, over and over, loud and clear above the reverberation of the train. What shall we find at our journey's end? And when it was reached at nightfall, Grandpapa still had Ben's fingers in his grasp. The valet rushed into the Pullman from another car, gathered up the luggage, and out all the passengers poured from the train— there on the platform was Dr. Presbury himself. "'It is not so bad as we feared,' were his first words, as he reached Mr. King's side, and, without waiting for a word, for he saw the old gentleman was beyond it, he led the way to his carriage. "'Stop a bit,' Grandpapa made out to say through white lips. "'A telegram. Tell them at home.' He looked at Ben, but Dr. Presbury sprang back into the station, wrote it, sent it off, and was with them once more, and then it was only a matter of moments and Jasper was reached at the master's house where he had been carried after the fire. "'Don't go in,' said one of a crowd of boys, who surrounded Ben on the steps, old Mr. King being in advance, a medical man and one or two teachers coming out of the house to meet the party. "'Don't go in,' he repeated, laying detaining hands on him, it's perfectly awful in there. Everybody's crying. He may want me, said Ben, hoarsely, nodding toward the white-haired old gentleman ahead, and trying to free himself. The other boys closed in around him. Oh, Dr. Smith won't let you get near him, volunteered one boy. Catch him, which proved to be true. Old Mr. King was just at the moment being ushered into the front parlor, and the medical man followed and closed the door with such a snap that it was impossible for anyone else to even dream of entering. "'Now what did I tell you?' said the boy, triumphantly. "'You're Ben, aren't you?' asked the first boy, who hadn't relinquished his hold, the other boys drawing up. "'Yes,' said Ben. "'Well, we've heard all about you, and the rest of you.' King talked just whole packs about you all. Don't, said Ben, and he put up his hand. Everything seemed to turn suddenly dark. Hush up, Grayson, can't you have some sense? said a tall, dark-haired boy, angrily, and by a speedy movement he had rescued Ben from the first grasp. Now then, come over to my room. He pointed to a long building on the west, and I'll tell you all about it. But Grayson had no mind to be so easily pushed off. "'That's no fair,' he cried. "'I had him first. "'No, sir, take your hands off. "'I'm—' And he clutched Ben again, determined to fight to the end for possession. "'That's right. Get out, Tim.' A dozen voices took it up in a subdued tone, it is true, but equally determined to see fair play. And the tall, dark-haired boy, being shouldered off the steps— 
Ben soon found himself sitting down in the midst of Jasper's school companions, Grayson still hanging like a leech to him. "'You see, we can't do anything but hang around here,' one of the boys was saying, "'and when anybody comes out, why, we hear a bit how he is. "'And to think it needn't have happened only for Pip. "'Oh, dear!' said a stout, chubby-cheeked boy, "'who didn't look as if he ever did anything but laugh and eat. "'Pip! He wasn't worth saving, little rat!' exploded Tim, who, being on the outskirts of the crowd, had to vent his vexation over somebody. "'You'd better let King hear you say that,' cried a boy, with a belligerent glance over at Tim. Then, as he remembered how little prospect there might be of Jasper's ever being troubled by the remark, he ground his teeth together to keep from saying more before Ben. "'See here, fellows. Grayson, having made first capture, deemed it his further duty to do the right thing by Ben. We ought to tell him all about it, and I'll begin.' and without more ado he started off. Ben clasped his woolen gloves tightly together, and looked over the heads of the boys up to the sky. Was it possible that the stars had ever twinkled in friendly fashion at them, as Polly and the other children had run out of the little brown house with him at such fortunate times when their mother had let them sit up? and the moon had beamed down on them, too, so sociably that Polly made up little stories about their shining light, so that they had all grown to love them very dearly. Now it seemed as if great tears were dropping out of the sky, and Ben shivered and listened, and gripped his hands tighter together than ever. "'You see, it began—well, no one knows how it did begin,' Grayson was rushing on. "'I think Beggins was drunk.' "'What stuff!' ejaculated another boy, contemptuously. "'Beggins never got off the handle. The doctor would have fired him long ago.' "'There must always be a first time,' said Grayson, nowise discomfited. "'Beggins is the night watchman,' he explained to Ben. "'Well, anyway, hush up, fellows. The fire broke out. We don't any of us know how. It doesn't signify.' What we do know is that in about five minutes from the first alarm it got too hot for us in there. He hopped to his feet and pointed to the broken outline of a long building. Even in the dim light, Ben, dropping his gaze from the sky, could see the ruined chimney, the ragged side wall, and the blackened, crushed windows. And it was every one to save his skin— "'Great Scott! I'll never forget that yell that Toddy sent up. "'He's the teacher on our hall, Todd is,' Grayson explained again, "'as he dropped into his seat beside Ben. "'Nor the bell clanging,' put in another boy. "'Christopher Columbus! I thought it was all day with us then. "'And I couldn't find my clothes.' "'Well, twas no worse for you than for any of us,' "'retorted the boy, the other side of Grayson.' There wasn't a rag for any of us to get into but blankets and sheets and— You see, we were waked up out of a sound sleep. It was about three o'clock this morning. Grayson took the words out of any mouth that might be intending to explain. So we just famosed the ranch. I tell you, there was some tall sprinting, and King was with us. I remember seeing him, but he was last, and he looked back. Then somebody sang out, Where's Pip? Pip? Ben found his tongue, that had seemed to be glued to the roof of his mouth, enough for that one syllable. Oh, it isn't his real name, said Grayson, in a hurry to explain again, before anyone else could put in a word. His own was so ridiculously long. Cornelius Leffingwell. Only think, for such a mite of a chap, so we had to call him Pip, you see. Well, somebody was fool enough to scream out, "'Where's Pip?' and Jasper turned back. Ben clenched both hands tightly together in a grip that would have hurt but for the woolen gloves. And I roared out, "'Come along, King!' and so did I. And I! The voices took it up, one after another. For it wasn't the time to look out for any skin but your own. It was as much as your life was worth to turn back,' cried Grayson, bearing down on the other voices. "'Boys!' The big door back of them burst open suddenly, and a teacher's head appeared, making them all jump as if shot. 
Go right away from these steps. How is he? Nothing seemed to dash Grayson, and he took time to ask this quite comfortably, still holding to Ben, while the other boys moved off the steps and around the corner of the master's house. Somewhat better. Be off with you. The teacher waved his hand and closed the door. That old Starrett, well, he's a dragon, declared Grayson between his teeth, and, dragging Ben to a convenient angle, where the other boys soon gathered, the narrative was taken up where it had been dropped. I grabbed King, but you might as soon try to hold an eel. He would go. Ben groaned, and this time so heavily that Grayson pulled himself up short. See here, I won't tell any more. You're going to keel over. For answer, he was in an instant whirled completely around on his two feet, and instead of his having any sort of a grasp on Ben, it was the visitor who held his coat collar in a woolen gloved hand in such a way that it didn't seem as if Grayson were ever to be free again. Now tell everything you know. I can't wait. Be quick about it. It was the same face he had shown to Jane, and, just as she had done, Grayson made all possible haste to answer, "'Oh, I will, I will!' The other boys, in their astonishment, staring silently at the two. "'Pip couldn't be found. He slept in the north wing, but he'd run into another boy's room, so King lost time, and if he hadn't screeched—Pip, I mean—why, he never would have got out. And there King—oh, well, he crawled under the bed—Pip, I mean, nasty little beggar— and there King found him and dragged him out. He told us all about it, Pip, I mean, and King slung him on his back, and by that time it was no use to try for the stairs. The flames were roaring up like mad, so King tried for the roof of the lab, had to go through Toddy's room and jumped out of one of the windows, and he made it. Oh, don't hang on to a fellow so. And there we saw him, and the fireman got a ladder up, and, oh— here Grayson gave out and actually blubbered. Ben looked around for someone to take up the tale, and the tall, dark-haired boy they had called Tim, now seeing his opportunity, pushed up. "'It's better you should have the hole,' he said. "'Without a bit of warning we saw the roof overhanging the lab—laboratory, of course, I mean—waver, and then fall, and we screamed to King to look out. It wouldn't have done any good if he had heard—' for the chimney toppled, and some bricks knocked him over, and then he saw it coming and kept Pip underneath. Ben's hand had fallen from the jacket collar to his side, and he didn't seem to breathe. "'You are to come. Mr. King wants you.' Somebody reached through the crowd of boys and drew him off and away. End of chapter 7 Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California